Well, a warm welcome to today's talk, Thursday the 4th of August. Now, the largest study so far on long COVID has just been published, and it is quite disconcerting. And when we combine this study, large-scale study, with previous smaller-scale pathological studies looking at actual organ damage, um, it puts it into context. Now, it's not that common. It looks like about 1 in 200 or 1 in 230 people are getting significant long COVID, but some of those, a significant proportion of those, unfortunately may have permanent problems. But let's get straight down to it. Um, here, here's the initial data here. Across all variants of the virus, apart from Omicron, this doesn't include Omicron times, so this is the original Wuhan type, the Alpha type, the Delta type in the UK. Three main clusters of symptoms. So people kind of go into these groupings Central neurological cluster, like nervous system type features, is one. Next one is cardiorespiratory. Cardio, of course, is heart respiratory as the lungs. That's the next cluster. And uh, debilitating multi-organ systemic sort of inflammatory things, including long-term fever. And things that basically can affect any parts of the body, muscle aches and things like that. Uh, but can be quite debilitating is the third group. So regardless of the variance, these are the types of long COVID clusters. Nervous system, cardiorespiratory, multi-organ systemic inflammatory. That's what uh, it fits uh, into. And, and so what we'll do now is we'll look at these in turn and look at them in detail. But just before we go on, we will notice after this that vaccination didn't really seem to make any difference to the likelihood of quali the qualitative nature of the long COVID, but, but more on that in a minute. Now, starting off with the uh, central neurological cluster, uh, anosmia, loss of smell or abnormal or reduced smell, very common. Fatigue. Now, fatigue, of course, can have many causes, but this is more the neurological cause of fatigue. Brain fog, that sort of groggy feeling that you're not quite there. I've had this a few times. Um, I had it after a bad ear infection and it's it's horrible. It's almost like you're watching yourself on a video. It's kind of a derealization for me. Different people experience it differently, of course, but really very unpleasant uh, symptom, brain fog. Simple depression. Um, again, terrible condition, can be terrible, can make people feel absolutely wretched. Delirium is like a confusional state where you can be disorientated for time, place, person, confusion, difficult, difficulty thinking. And headache, of course, is, is common in that, in that group of symptoms. And um, what the researchers found was that this, um, this cluster, this neurological cluster, um, was the, uh, the largest in both the alpha and the delta variants. And it was the second in the uh, the wild type variant. Now, of course, the wild type variant, there was no uh, vaccines at all. It came and went. The original Wuhan uh, virus came and went without vaccination. Then alpha came, uh, vaccination came in during alpha. And of course, during delta, people were very uh, fairly comprehensively vaccinated. So how much this is accounting for the difference, it's, it's unclear. But uh, the data clearly shows that this was the largest cluster in the Alpha and Delta times. So most people who've got this recently are presenting with this central neurological sort of presentation. Now, we could look at about a dozen consistent studies because it's always good to compare and contrast and see if it makes sense. So this is a good study from the UK Biobank, which is a UK, as it suggests, it's where the UK collects biological data with many people contributing to that. And the paper was called this. Um, SARS coronavirus 2 is associated with the changes in brain structure. Changes in brain structure. So this is consistent. And the idea that I'm explaining this is this, presenting this, is this probably explaining some of the previous features. Now, the UK Biobank study found reduction in grey matter thickness. Now, basically, there's two sorts of matter in the central, well, in, in the brain anyway, the, you know, in the central nervous system. You've got grey matter around the outside, white matter on the inside, although there are nuclei of grey matter on the inside as well. But the grey matter basically is nerve cells, the nerve cell bodies. And, and the white matter is basically the nerve cell fibres. 
So if there's a reduction in the thickness of grey matter, that indicates there's been a loss of grey matter, a loss of uh, neurocortical cells. And these don't regenerate. It, it, it's that simple. Um, th there is no significant regeneration, no significant ongoing mitosis, essentially no ongoing mitosis cell division in grey uh, neurocortical cells. Now, of course, all of the people with neurological symptoms won't have this loss of... Uh, there's this loss of brain cells but we know that some do and and this is concerning because it could well be um this is a potentially permanent effect so definitely the biobank study showed reduction in gray matter thickness that won't recover unfortunately if it's caused by loss of cells which it probably is tissue damage to the primary olfactory cortex that's where you smell with and again if there's damage to the nerve cells in the olfactory cortex that probably won't recover significantly meaning people basically won't recover. If this is true, meaning people won't recover their sense of smell to any significant amount. And the UK Biobank study also showed reduction in global brain size, and again, that may not recover. So I, th I think what we're seeing here in this neurological group, as with other groups, um, we've got the people who are presenting the symptoms, some of those symptoms are caused by temporary, reversible, physiological changes in the nervous system, which will get better. Others of those changes are caused by permanent tissue damage, in this case in the brain, which won't get better. Now, we hope that most are in the physiological group, where there's a pathophysiological derangement that will recover. And we hope there's only a very small minority that have got permanent tissue damage. But the bottom line is we don't know which is which at the moment. So how many people, some people are going to be left with long, lifelong debilitating effects from this because of these neurological, this neurological damage. The proportion of those we simply don't know at the moment. It is concerning. We've seen this after previous pandemics, the, the encephalitis lethargica that occurred after the 1918-19 pandemic, post-encephalitic Parkinsonism that occurred after that pandemic. Um, I mean, I can remember seeing people with that when, when, I, when I was a student. I mean, it's long time ago but uh, the oldest people were still around then from from the pandemic and um, they had it for the rest of their lives so big unknown there how much is temporary pathophysiolog pathophysiological derangement how much is actual damage similar picture really with the cardio um, cardio respiratory one uh, this was the largest cluster in the wild type period now again whether that's caused by the lack of vaccination or whether that's caused by a difference in the uh, the viral presentation, we don't really know. Uh, symptoms may reflect lung damage here. So dyspnea, um, this this difficulty breathing, shortness of breath going upstairs, shortness of breath on exercise, all of those things. Chest pain. Now, if, if the chest pain is um, associated with um, breathing, um, like when you take a deep breath in, you get the chest pain. That that can be pleuritic or it can be the the pericardium. If the chest pain is constant, is more constant or referred particularly to the left arm and into the jaw, that can be cardiac. So anyone with chest pain should get an immediate medical um, referral to to work out which it is, because chest pain should always be taken uh, seriously. Uh, so different presentations of chest pain, ongoing fatigue. Now, again, we looked at fatigue in the neurological um, thing, neurological section, cohort, <laughs> and, and, and fatigue, of course, can be neurological, but fatigue can be cardiovascular as well. So if you have damage to the heart and the heart's not pumping properly, you're not pumping the blood around the body, the blood's not getting to your brain, the blood's not getting to your muscles, you'll have fatigue. You put perfectly healthy young fit athletes on beta blockers that prevent the heart from contracting properly, beta blocking drugs, they'll report undue fatigue. Um, it's due to reduced cardiac output. Again, how much of that is due to temporary physiological derangement of the heart and how much of that is due to permanent damage of the heart muscles? Because if the actual myocytes, the cells in the myocardium have actually died, again, they're not going to recover, unfortunately. So again, some proportion are going to get better or have degrees of recovery. Others are probably going to have lifelong disability as a result of this. The proportions of which we don't know yet. Palpitations is another feature, awareness of the, uh, the heart beating. Irregular or uh, awareness of the heart, whether it's fast or irregular or pounding or whatever it is. 
consistent from a study in medicine. We're only going to, going to give one again. Clinical characteristics and outcomes of post-COVID pulmonary fibrosis. This is the reference here. I think it's published in Nature. Um, direct quote, post-COVID-19 pulmonary fibrosis is a severe complication that leads to permanent lung damage and death. So um, it's a bit, the lungs are a bit like the liver. If, if, if they've got great powers of recovery. But if the scar tissue is, is established, like in the liver, if cirrhosis is established, that's not reversible. For that part of the liver, at least. And again, if there's fibrosis in the lungs, the normal lung architecture, the bronchioles and the alveoli and the blood vessels, aren't going to recover. The pulmonary fibrosis for that part of the lung is permanent. So again, it's hoping that most of these cases are temporary pathophysiological derangements, but a proportion will be inevitably, unfortunately, uh, caused by permanent lung uh, damage. Uh, moving on to the next third category that's been identified, um, debilitating multi-organ uh, symptoms. Now, this could be anything. I remember a lot of people had ongoing uh, fever, for, for example, um, uh, in the early days. But the, these are systemic inflammatory effects affecting the whole body, inflammation in the whole body, abdominal symptoms, muscle pains. But basically, whatever is being uh, affected um, is the organ that will, uh, will, will present the clinical feature. So it could be a very wide variety of clinical features presenting in that. And some of these people are really quite uh, debilitated. Again, how many are caused by tissue damage that may not regenerate? Uh, how many are caused by tissue damage that will regenerate because some tissues regenerate much better than others? Liver, for example, is a superb uh, regenerator. Whereas if the architecture of the kidney is lost, that, that's not going to regenerate. Uh, the, the, the muscle pain's also in there. Um, so again, hoping that most of these are temporary, but there's going to be a proportion. We don't know how big a proportion, whether it's a minority or a majority of the cases that are going to be permanent, unfortunately. Now, regards vaccines, um, very controversial issue. So I'm going to be careful. Uh, direct quotes, vaccination and long COVID. Direct quote from the, uh, the King's study that we're quoting. We did not observe evidence of qualitative different symptom clusters in vaccinated versus unvaccinated individuals. The vaccine made no difference to the quality of the symptoms that were experienced. Now, the authors did, admin, uh, did, did say that there was a limitation here because they hadn't taken fully into account people that were vaccinated then infected versus people that were infected then vaccinated and the timing. So they don't claim to have comprehensive timing data, but in terms of the quality of the clusters and the symptoms, it didn't make a difference. Surprising because previous studies have and there's always been this assumption that vaccination would reduce the uh, likelihood of long COVID but that's the direct quote we did not observe evidence of qualitative different symptoms clustering vaccinated with unvaccinated in either the alpha or the delta and of course with the Wuhan wild type there was no vaccine so it doesn't come into it. So that's, that's, the, that's the main points I wanted to get across. Um, I'll just run through a little bit of background very briefly, um, but that's the main part of the video done now. Uh, it's now evident uh, that with post-COVID um, syndrome presents with heterogeneous profiles, many different presentations, it's not one disease. So they need to characterize it to have personal care. Uh, this was from the, uh, the COVID symptom study 336,000 people um, who tested positive. So we know that these were positive. Um, now, long COVID lasted for more than 28 days. Uh, Post-COVID syndrome, they're saying, lasts for more than uh, 12 weeks. Uh, they had 1,459 with post-COVID syndrome. Uh, that's more than 12 weeks. Now, that works out at 230. Now, this is encouraging because there's about 2 million people with long COVID in the UK at the moment. And it looks like most of them will not go on to have the symptoms for more than 12 weeks. Um, is there a high proportion of people with permanent tissue damage in the post-COVID syndrome lasting for more than 12 weeks than in those that recover in four weeks? Inevitably, that is the case. So we could be dealing with this post-12 weeks um, post-COVID syndrome 
after 12 weeks after the re resolution of acute symptoms there's a higher proportion of permanent injuries in those. We still hope it's the minority, but it will be a higher proportion. They did all sorts of cluster analysis. Pretty, pretty amazing study, actually, if you read it. There's masses of material there. I'm only scratching the surface. They looked at different variants. They looked at vaccination status. Uh, they looked at all of these things, symptom prevalence, duration, demography, prior conditions, uh, comorbidities, Findings were actually more complicated than this. So this is the, we've just done a summary here. But wild type variants, they found four, four main endotypes. Alpha variant, there was seven. Delta variant, there was uh, Delta variant, there was five. So um, again, we can't possibly go into this in the video. Uh, but um, an endotype is, is um, a subvariant of a disease with a different pathophysiology. In other words, there is a whole host of different pathological features going on here giving rise to the different features yet nevertheless they can mostly be classified into those three the uh, central neurological uh, the cardio respiratory and the debilitating multi-organ uh, systemic inflammatory features but they were able to come across many more classifications indicating that this viral infection is, is, is damaging um, a wide variety of people in a wide variety of ways. Their interpretation, our classification may be used to understand uh, distinct mechanisms of the post-COVID syndrome, which is good, um, as well as subgroups uh, of individuals at risk of prolonged debilitation. Now, um, just a quick word from the authors. Uh, Dr. Claire Steves, um, these data show clearly that post-COVID syndrome is not just one condition, but appears to have at least several subtypes, as we said, three main ones and other ones underneath that. Understanding the root cause of these subtypes may help in finding treatment strategies, of course, because if we know what's going wrong in the body, we're going to have a much better chance of fixing it. Moreover, these data emphasise the need for long COVID services to incorporate a personalised approach. Absolutely personalized approach sensitive to each individual and dr uh, dr Keynes, another author uh, these insights could aid the uh, development of personalized diagnosis and treatment for these individuals so as always um, it's good to understand the physiology um, that helps us to understand what goes wrong the pathophysiology and the pathology and if we understand that we can we can work out the best strategy to treat these patients. So let's hope that the proportion of people with permanent organ damage is remarkably small and the people with tempor temporary pathophysiological aberrations is remarkably large. But right now, we simply don't know that. So there we go. That's the latest on long COVID. Um, for a minority of patients, this is going to be a lifelong problem. Um, we hope for the majority there's going to be good levels of recovery. But if people have had the symptoms for 12 weeks or more, um, we actually don't know that to any great extent as of yet. And disappointing that the vaccines aren't making any qualitative difference to these, to these uh, syndromes. So thank you for watching, and um, I think I think I haven't put it below for a while. But um, th th these are my books here. Um, I, 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 they're, they're now free on PDF. So this is if you if you're serious about learning about this kind of stuff, this one's all on physiology, how the body works, lots of diagrams. This one's all on pathophysiology, how the body goes wrong, all the different bits and bobs of the body that go wrong with lots of diagrams took me years to write them so it'd be good if someone would read them and I'll put the PDF link for free downloads uh, in the uh, in the description okay thank you for watching